peace. Peace is something I would say everyone needs and wants and desires. Peace is something that we seek. We seek to have peace in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts, in our nation, in our world. But it's difficult. We recognize we don't have peace in a lot of these ways. In our world, there's wars going on in our nation, political unrest, in our own hearts, in our own lives, in the situations that we are intimately a part of. We struggle with this lack of peace. In fact, in a human way, peace is impossible. It's only through Jesus Christ that we can achieve peace. Peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So if you're following the Lord, if you're seeking to do his will, we can experience that peace. For myself, that's very much an indicator on if I'm doing what the Lord is calling me to do. Because the world is often, I'd say even always, going to lack peace. And so the only peace that I can find is by following the Lord and being given that gift or fruit of the Holy Spirit. But the way in which we seek peace in Jesus is by unity. We are called to be unified in and through following Jesus. That's the only way we can achieve peace as a church, as an individual, as who we're called to be as Christians, as Catholics. And so our scriptures speak to that reality today and speak about the unity in which the Lord wants for us. The first reading from Jeremiah says, Woe to you, shepherds! It's always concerning as a priest. You hear God say that through the prophet, Woe to you, shepherds! I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, speaking to me. Um, And others, right? So bishops, priests, deacons grandparents, parents, friends, workers, leaders in our our lives. These are our shepherds. They seek to lead us, right? So we need to know who our shepherds are. We need to know that they're ultimately, if not specifically, leading us to Jesus. Because Jeremiah goes on to say that God will gather us together and appoint new shepherds and ultimately the shepherd the lord of justice jesus so jesus is that which the shepherd should be leading us to so whether a shepherd is leading us to jesus or not this is a shepherd you should follow or not but you should know your shepherds And so I've been here about two and a half weeks, so I'm sure you know me pretty well at this point, right? Probably not, right? But we'll get to know each other as we go on. But I want to give you just a very short bio on who I am. Born and raised Catholic. My parents are Catholic. I'm three of four living children. St. Jane Francis de Chantal in Pasadena, Maryland, born and raised there. I went to Catholic school through the fifth grade at my home parish. And then I switched over to public school, middle school and high school pursued a education in uh, vocational work, so working with my hands, uh, because I didn't want to go to college. It didn't work out well, uh, being called to be a priest, but, you know, it was, it was good at the time. I did a lot of different trade stuff. I received all my sacraments at my home parish. I went to college for a year after high school, uh, and I worked in industrial cleaning for about five years after that. And In that time, I got closer and closer in my relationship with the Lord and started to serve as a young adult for youth ministry. We went on a mission trip to Mississippi in 2006 after Katrina happened in 2005 to help with the cleanup of the coast of Louisiana, Texas, and Mississippi. I was in Mississippi primarily. And in that, I felt very strongly called to the priesthood in the midst of service. I was fully dedicating all my time, my waking hours to the Lord. Whatever I was doing was dedicated to the Lord, and the Lord said, I want you to be a priest. 
And I said, all right, Lord, we'll see how that works. And so I discerned it for about six months, and in my current job, uh, I was un unable to sort of enter into a good discernment. So I got a job as a maintenance man for my home parish for about two and a half years while I discerned my vocation to the priesthood seriously. I did about a year of discernment with the Capuchins, Second Order Franciscans, and then ultimately I felt very at home, at peace, uh, being called to be a seminarian and then a priest for the Archdiocese of Baltimore since I was born and raised there. So nine and a half years of formation and then five and a half years of priesthood uh, brings me here. So as I said, you'll get to know me a little bit more as time moves forward, but just a short bio of where I'm coming from and my background, because you should know your shepherds. Father Theoscanus and Father Daniel and I met together because we want to be unified as your shepherds, leading you to Jesus and have a similar message. And so our message this weekend is unity, right? It's a good thing to do. So unity in where our shepherds are leading us. So know your shepherds, so they're leading us to Jesus. Jesus in the gospel, after his apostles had gone out and come back, they'd done good work, Jesus says, come away with me a while to a deserted place. Now, practically in the gospel, we see that doesn't work very well because the people follow them around the Sea of Galilee and they don't really get that deserted place. But the desire and the need to be alone, ideally in a deserted place with Jesus, is what the Lord wants for us. So the second way in which we are called to be unified is in our prayer with our Lord. This weekend, the Acts retreat for the teenagers is going on, and I was able to go there for Saturday morning Mass, and they, I told them they were privileged to go away a while to be with the Lord, to encounter the Lord in the Eucharist, in the sacraments, in his teachings, to just be in his presence so that they're formed and prepared for whatever the Lord is calling us. And so that's good. We need that. We need those retreats. We, as priests and deacons, promise to do it once a year, at least for a week. But all people need a retreat. But the retreat is maybe once a year, if you're lucky. But we need a daily going away with the Lord. We need time of prayer on a daily basis. We need to be praying to our Lord. If we're to be unified, if we're to be following Jesus as a people, we need to be seeking him in our private prayer. So the second way we need to be unified is in our private prayer, seeking the Lord to be away, deserted place, if possible, a place where we can focus on where the Lord is leading us. And then in the second reading, St. Paul speaking to the Ephesians. St. Paul was going all across the known world. He went to the Colossians, the Corinthians, the Romans, the Galatians. All these different people, the Ephesians today. And he was preaching unity. He was saying, hey, we need to be unified in what we're doing. We're all following Jesus. He didn't seek to bring about this unity through worldly means or through political means, but in the reality of what God has done for us in the person of Jesus Christ. So he talks about these two persons, these two peoples. The two peoples he's talking about are the, the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews had been led by the Lord up to that point, to the point of Jesus where the new and everlasting covenant is formed, where the Gentiles are grafted onto God's divine plan and brought into the fullness of God's relationship with God. And so that's what he's speaking about today. These two peoples, no longer one, not, no longer two, but one, right? We, most of us, don't have any Jewish heritage. We're all Gentiles here. But we are one people. We are united in the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, all people are united in Jesus Christ all across the world, and especially as Catholics, as Christians. 
because the way in which Jesus draws us together isn't just by, you know, well, it is. I mean, it's by the new and everlasting covenant. But the way in which he does that is very beautiful. God, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, becomes incarnate in the Virgin Mary, becomes fully man. So God and man are in the person, or Jesus is the person that is both fully God and fully man. And so not only is he drawing Gentile and Jew together, but he's drawing all humanity together with God. This new and everlasting covenant is a new relationship with God, where the dignity of the human person is raised in and through who Jesus is, and then he allows himself to be put to death, putting that enmity to death, that enmity both between the Jew and the Gentile, as well as the enmity between man and God, and is raised to new life. And we share in this as Catholics, as Christians. Baptism is a celebration of this reality. I die to self in baptism and am raised as a new creation in Christ. This unity is fundamental to what we're called to do. As Catholics, it is the first mark of the church. One holy, Catholic, apostolic, one, unity. We are called to be unified. And so we need to question that reality. Am I unified in my following of Jesus? Am I unified with the people around me? Am I unified in this pastorate of St. Francis and St. Louis? Or do we say, oh no, they're different. We're different than them. We do different things. Are you? Are you different? Are you following someone else? Because we're all supposed to be following Jesus. We're all baptized in Jesus Christ. We're all raised to new life, given the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. We are united. The Lord wants this for us. In fact, in two, uh, 1995, St. John Paul II wrote on this fact and said that we all might be one, which is from John 17, where Jesus prays for us to be as one as Jesus and the Father are one. This reality, what God wants for and he prays for us specifically, like he says, those who follow the apostles, us, that we may be one as I and the Father am one. So this unity that we're called to is such an inherent part of who we are as Catholics, as Christians, as sons and daughters of God, as God's beloved children. So he wants to unify us in and through shepherds, in and through our prayer, and in and through our church. Let us seek to bear witness to that unity in our words and our actions, how we treat each other, how we love each other, how we seek to act as one people following our Lord Jesus Christ.